Andy Kaufman satirizes Elvis in that scene from Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey as the weird but inspired comedian. And that is one of five new movies we'll review this week. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Joel Siegel, film critic on ABC's Good Morning America. And thank you for coming back this A week. A pleasure, Roger. Okay, in the ten brief years between his first appearance on Saturday Night Live in 1975 and his death in 1984, Andy Kaufman made a singular reputation as a comedian. He was frustrating, brilliant, infuriating, and inspired. You either loved him or you hated him. Fans actually voted him off of Saturday Night Live, and you never knew if he was putting you on. Now Kaufman's strange career is the subject of Man on the Moon, biography starring perhaps the only actor who could possibly play him, Jim Carrey. In his early nightclub gigs, Kaufman's material is so off the wall that audiences don't even know if he's trying to entertain them. But it's... Totally original. I mean, no one's ever done it. I'm not like everyone else. Well, everybody else gets this place cooking. It was cooking. I thought it was cooking. There was a man over here that was really upset. Yeah, he stormed out and a lot of other people left in the middle of Iraq. A few people can see the genius at the center of his storm. And one of them is Agent George Sapiro, played by Danny DeVito. Hey, I really enjoyed your set. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I really like what you did out there. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> So, uh, I understand you're from Lithuania. No, I am from Caspiar. Caspiar, huh? It is a very small island in the Caspian Sea. It's sunk. The agent gets Kaufman a job on the hit TV sitcom Taxi, and this montage shows actors recreating their famous roles for the movie. We see Mary Lou Henner, Christopher Lloyd, Judd Hirsch, Jeff Conaway and Carol Kane. I hope you have a small family. Then Kaufman gets fascinated by the theatrical possibilities in wrestling with women. He proposes to one of his opponents, played by Courtney Love. I'll get up in the ring and I'll announce that I'll marry the first woman who beats me. Then you can get up and we'll wrestle. And I'll let you win. You'll let me win. I'll let you win. <laughs> Jim Carrey's performance is kind of uncanny in this movie because as famous as he is, he's able to convince us to forget him and think about Andy Kaufman. I was convinced. And director Milos Forman doesn't make the mistake of forcing Kaufman's life story into conventional comic patterns. They just won't fit. With Kaufman, you never knew what was real and what was a con, and the movie is able to capture that ambiguity. It's a biography that walks the same tightrope that Kaufman balanced on between what was funny and what was eerie and even a little frightening. I knew Andy Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And to paraphrase, I knew Andy Kaufman and Jim Carrey is Andy Kaufman. That's high praise. An incredible performance. Mm -hmm. Not just the look and not just the sound, but the way his eyes move back mm -hmm. and forth, that you know, there's something insane going on back there. Andy Kaufman was a genius. And what I loved about this movie was the first half of the film when you see Kaufman exploring all these amazing comedic possibilities. And then I felt about the film exactly the way I felt about Kaufman's life. The end with the wrestling, it became sexist. He refused to admit that he was playing a character. Yeah, he always pushed it a little further than it would go. That's part of the fascination of it. And you know, last night, after having seen this film, I went home and I looked at a tape of Kaufman doing Tony Clifton, who was his famous... Lounge Persona act. that, yeah, like angry, and world's worst human being. I played it back and I listened again because Carrie's voice as Tony Clifton is exactly the same as Kaufman's voice as Tony Clifton. This, now, that, that's just imitation. I mean, that's not a performance. But Carrie goes on here to really build. Here is a guy, Carrie, a comic actor who here does an acting job, who portrays somebody else. He never falls for the temptation of getting laughs as Jim Carrey. It's a great performance. I was there in Carnegie Hall when Andy Kaufman stood up in front of uh, 3,000 people and read The Great Gatsby. And I'm thinking, what's the joke here? And he read the whole book. Well, he read the whole book. And Did I you say to the end? <laughs> no, I, but <laughs> I'm thinking, what's the joke? And the joke is, here's this guy sold out Carnegie Hall, and he's reading The Great Gatsby. <laughs> I think Carrey deserves an Oscar nomination, a long way from his first big movies where he played Ace Ventura, the guy who talked through his tushy. Well. Ace Ventura Trump's our next movie, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, 
a would-be comedy whose one claim to fame is that it's the last truly horrible movie of the century. <laughs> there is also one laugh. Rob Schneider plays a goofball who cleans fish tanks. <laughs> What the hell are you doing? There's a mongrel koi in there. It's the most dangerous of all goldfish. No, that's not the one laugh. Schneider gets invited in by Oded Fair, who to me is the living example of a bad taste joke out of my adolescence. He doesn't have pimples because they slide off. But Rob Schneider is in awe, and here comes the laugh. Women pay me to give them pleasure. How'd you get that job? I'm just gonna fell into it. I'm gonna kill my guidance counselor. That's it. What happens next? Schneider fish sits for fair, and because he's stupid, busts the aquarium. He then has to sell his body to replace the tank and fish, which allows the filmmakers to do bad jokes about people with physical and emotional handicaps. Hi, I'm Deuce Bigelow. Hi, I'm Carol. I have narcolepsy. It's a sleeping disorder. These are jokes for nine-year-old sensibilities, but the subject matter is grown-up, sex, which earned the film its R rating for repulsive. Oh, Make that R for reprehensible. There is the obligatory disclaimer at the end about how no fish were injured during the making of this film, but how about the movie critics who were injured watching Deuce Bigelow? Male gigolo. Male gigolo. You know, uh, I did get another laugh out of it than you did. I thought Eddie Griffin was pretty funny as the pimp, and he has a little illustrated lecture using three fish bowls to demonstrate where Deuce stands in the pecking order of gigolos. So that's two laughs. But on the other hand, you're right. I mean, we don't even have to spend any time on this movie. It's vulgar, uh, it's disgusting, it's in very bad taste, and it's not funny, and that's it. Took the words right out of my mouth. Okay, coming up later, Michael Caine in The Cider House Rules. And coming up next, a story about young Orson Welles, Cradle Will Rock. Can we be alone? Oh, me? Yes. Just me? Yes. Have a good day, sweetheart. Have a good day, sweetheart. On December 17th, he shows characteristics like creativity, friendship. You're invited. It is a household appliance to look beneath the skin of a robot. Hey! Yeah. I saw the inner me. And discover the heart of a man. I am trying to make something of myself. Robin Williams. How's it going? Bicentennial Man. Rated PG. Starts Friday, December 17th. Are you strong? Can you lift things? Yes, ma'am. Project 891 needs a stagehand. Do you know what a stagehand does? Completely unglamorous work. Push a broom, lift scenery, pull ropes, that sort of thing. Are you interested? Yes, ma'am. You bet. Jobless and homeless during the Depression, Emily Watson looks for work in the Federal Theater Project in that scene. And the FTP was a government-subsidized program to provide work in the theater and free or cheap public theater for audiences. It was a launching pad for many great talents, including young Orson Welles. The new film, Cradle Will Rock, written and directed by Tim Robbins, follows the history of a play of the same name written by Mark Blitstein and produced by Welles and John Hausman, whose Mercury Theater would go on to make That's Citizen Kane. You know, Cradle Rock is about prostitution. Prostitution of education, prostitution of the press, mm. prostitution of the courts, mm. and most important... Yeah, uh, the Washington 29, no. Most important for you and me, mm. Orson, mm. prostitution of the artist. The movie tells a parallel story about the tension between left-wing artists and right-wing congressmen. Bill Murray plays a ventriloquist who is smitten with Joan Cusack, a WPA clerk who rehearses for an appearance before the Un-American Activities okay, Committee. Well, each one. I don't know about this. You don't know about this? You. Me? I don't want to be rude, but this is distracting. Distracting? Can you stop him? Stop me? Yes, you. What you? Please, Mr. Crickshaw. More left-right tension. Nelson Rockefeller, played by John Cusack, has commissioned a mural for Rockefeller Center from the Mexican communist artist Diego Rivera, played by Ruben Blades. Up top there. Is that a war of some kind? That's a battlefield. Men in the Holocaust of war. And beneath it, unemployed workers being beaten by the police. Do you like it? The production of Cradle Will Rock gets locked out of its own theater in a political squabble 
and Wells and Hausman desperately search for a new home. Uh, find me George Zorn. He's a booker. He'll know all the dark theaters. Well, smuggle the costumes out. Yes, yes, and the set. I hate the set. It's a nightmare. A brilliant idea, poorly executed. I've always said the play would work better on a bad stage. Actually, Holly said that. No, I said it. No, first. you didn't. Yes, I did. You did. Yes, I did. You did. Yes, I 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 did who don't already know and care something about the Federal Theater Project, Wells, Hausman, and all of the others. There's so much story to tell that unless you already know a little of it, you can lose the thread. My thumb is up, but I do have that reservation. <laughs> My problem is I know too much. This is what I studied in college. Mm -hmm. I had a terrific time. The cast, you've got Nelson Rockefeller, you've got Orson Welles, you've got the House on American Activities Committee, and Tim Robbins puts all of these things together and creates an absolute mess of a movie, but the mess was so much fun. To me, it was like eating paella. Well, you know, you don't like the clam? Okay, here's a little lobster. It's a mess in that he's trying to tell five or six stories that don't necessarily right. belong in the same movie. For example, Nelson Rockefeller and Diego Rivera really don't have that much to it do also with happened Cradle of Rock. Ha actually happened a year before, but, but it makes for a picture of the era that's fascinating. Absolutely. The only Absolutely. quibble I have is, if there's one person who was born to play Orson Welles, it's, it's Tim, Tim Robbins. Robbins. <laughs> yes. And here he's directing the film that doesn't play well. <laughs> Coming up next, John Irving's bestseller comes to the screen. Michael Caine stars in The Cider House Rules when we come back. Good night, you princes of Maine, you kings of New England. Why does Dr. Lurch say that every night? Does it because we like it? That's a scene from the Cider House Rules taken from the John Irving novel, and I have a confession to make, I never read the book. Not only did I not read the book, I had no idea if the rules in the Cider House Rules were a noun or a verb, but I fell in love with the story anyway. This is an orphanage, not the Cider House, and here Dr. Michael Caine rules, even if he struggles a bit with his New England accent. He reads Dickens, tucks the boys in, delivers unwanted children, and he teaches his trade to young Toby McGuire, whom he takes on as a part-time apprentice and full-time surrogate son. You know, I'm grateful for everything that you've done for me. I don't need your gratitude. I don't need this. I know all about my condition. It's your heart. You ought to take it with you. It's the 1940s, World War II. McGuire hitches a ride with Paul Rudd and his fiancée, Charlize Theron. I've never actually seen the ocean. Are you serious? When Rudd is called back to active duty, McGuire is off to see a few other things he's never seen before. Lassa Hallstrom directs, well, directly. That helps involve us in the story. And Charlie's Throne has become a fine actress. It's going to stand like this. And then, come on. Put your arm around me. Just cuddle and hug and, you know. And finally, the Cider House, where one of my favorite actors, Delroy Lindo, rules. Holmes got no experience out there, but he's smarter than I am. He's a fast learner. Look, Mr. Rose is going to teach you the apple business. Well, I believe this is history. We are making history, Wally. Hey, we? We're making history having this young man stay with us. The Cider House rules doesn't make history as much as it just tells one terrific story. Serious things happened. Delroy Lindo's last scene, an amazing piece of acting. Of course, they didn't send it. Why would the studio send the best stuff? True, a better actor would bring needed depth to Tobey Maguire's role, but John Irving worked 13 years on the script and not in vain. It wouldn't be my choice, but come Oscar time, we may find out all over again if the rules in the Cider House Rules is a noun or a verb, as in, come Oscar time, does Cider House Rules rule? Well, I don't think it will. I was really pretty disappointed in this film. I thought it was flat. I thought it was pointless. I got up at the end and I thought, what was that all about? There is this series of episodes that go on and on and on, more or less arbitrarily, uh, and take us away from the only interesting character in the movie, who frankly is Michael Caine. I found his performance good, I found his character fascinating, I found the Tony McGuire's hero uh, was pretty much of a dead zone as far as I've yeah, I agree. I didn't he, care about him, yeah, he I didn't reacts, care about anything that act, happened. Yes. I didn't really find much passion in his relationship with Charlize Theron, he always kind of stands there looking at her as if She's a specimen of love rather than the object of love. At the end, my hands were empty. 
I liked it. Okay, well, I didn't. <laughs> okay, our next movie is one of the best of the year. A powerful directorial debut by the actor Tim Roth, who tells a disturbing story of how a seemingly decent man can contain, within his affable facade, the appetites of a monster. The War Zone takes place in winter in an isolated region of England where young Tom and his sister Jesse have moved with their family. Their mother has just had a new baby, inspiring cozy domestic dialogue. Do you feel a little different having a new daughter? It's been a while. I don't know, I feel a bit scared, you know. Get your feet off the table. But at the same time, I feel very happy. No, it ain't. <laughs> Was it like that with us? Was it, um... No, well, you changed everything, you know? I mean, I've become a man. Dad, played by Ray Winston, seems like a nice guy, but then Tom discovers that all is not as it should be beneath the surface of their family. I saw you. I saw you what? The bath with Dad. Yeah. What were you doing? What do you think I'll stay? He had a bath. I got in and he got out. That's Freddie Cunliffe as Tom and Laura Belmont as his sister. There have been movies before about domestic sexual abuse. In fact, Cider House Rules was one, but rarely, if ever, has there been a movie so observant, so empathetic, and so disturbing. How young Tom handles his discoveries about his family is the film's central story. And it's not about discovering something, but about dealing with it, especially within a family that seems so happy on the surface. Among other things, he doesn't want to hurt his mother, who has just given birth to another girl. The father's behavior shows how humans are capable of building terrifying mental firewalls between evil doing and their ordinary lives. The War Zone is a masterful film. Tim Roth is one of our best actors, and now he shows that he's also one of our best directors. What was incredible about this film was the look of the film. The story is bleak. The film is bleak. Mm -hmm. Each picture is framed so beautifully. The opening shots, he holds his camera wide. He lets the action come into it. So th things look smaller than they are. So things look more insignificant than they might be. So we feel more insignificant than we and are. Because this family is in such a cold and bleak area, the fact that they're so happy, the mother is in love with the father. The father loves his kids. The kid loves the father. And then he finds out that his father is a monster. And yet, at the same time, to acknowledge that would destroy this facade of happiness that they all share. It's real complicated. It's not just a good and bad movie. It's a movie about things that are just tearing this poor boy apart. Not many movies deserve to be called great, and this one does. When we come back, a new video that stars Andy Kaufman, who's the subject of Jim Carrey's Man on the Moon. Thank you very much. I can't do anything without the instructions. Nothing. It's okay. She's got other presents. They were just here. They are right here. I just had them. We'll just hide this till her birthday. She's been wanting this for a long time. If I only hear those instructions. You look in the box? I looked in there. Did you take there. everything out of it? Oh, here they are. You, but DVDs are so easy. And the clarity. Tinkerbell tinks, you hear it. Simba purrs, you feel it. <laughs> you don't have a new digital ear, Dad. It's a digital revolution, Mom. Introducing Disney DVD. Maybe you should sleep on it. Pure digital magic. Roger Ebert in the Movies Video Pick of the Week is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. My video pick this week goes hand in hand with Man on the Moon, Milos Forman's new biography of Andy Kaufman. It's a newly released tape of Kaufman's 1981 Midnight Special hosted by Wolfman Jack. I looked at the video after seeing the film, as I said before, and I was impressed by what a good job Jim Carrey does of capturing Kaufman's mixture of insecurity, sincerity, Naivete and self satire. Here's Andy doing his Elvis imitation. Oh, my heart to be broken. There's the only one I got. Put up on him, please be careful. Hey, you know, 
for what I can't ever lie. But all the please don't break my heart up a fool. He wrestles with women as part of his act. And here he is as his protege, lounge lizard Tony Clifton. You know, I just came back uh, for me. Let me tell you something. It was so uh, cold there. How cold was it? I don't ask you. I didn't ask you. Can we start this again? I, I didn't ask you. Randy Kaufman, it's an act, and then again, you. it isn't an act. At some yeah, hidden psychological yeah. level, he's working on the audience as well as working with it. Daring people to tell him he's not funny and daring them to say, I'm not entertained. In a sense, Andy Kaufman's whole career was devoted to satirizing the idea of entertainment. You can see that at work on Andy Kaufman's Midnight Special, my video pick of the week. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. Two thumbs way up for Milos Forman's Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey as the late Andy Kaufman. It opens in two weeks. Two thumbs down, though, for Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, an egregiously abysmal comedy starring Rob Schneider. Two thumbs up for Tim Robbins' 1930s theatrical memoir, Cradle Will Rock. We split on the Cider House rules. Joel thought it was great storytelling. I thought it was meandering and pointless. And finally, two thumbs up with great admiration for Tim Ross, The War Zone, a great movie. But just in New York and L.A. to qualify for the Oscars. Sad, bleak, depressing, and time for the holidays. And I hope it does qualify. And also, of course, Men on the Moon is opening in two weeks. So thanks a lot for joining mm -hmm. me in the balcony this week. And remember, you can hear our reviews, Joel's and mine, on the web at ebert-movies.com, part of Go Network, and my print reviews at suntimes.com slash ebert. Next week, reviews of more new movies, including Magnolia, starring William H. Macy, Jason Robards, and Tom Cruise. Also, Bicentennial Man with Robin Williams is a robot who learns to become human. The secret to all this is imperfection. That's what makes us unique. I like the shape of your head. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. The new Roger Ebert's Movie Yearbook 2000. Now with every recent Ebert movie review. Available at bookstores everywhere.